Okay, first I'd like to thank Tim for inviting me to come and give this talk. I gave this talk last year. This year it's standing room only. I'm very impressed. So thank you all for coming out this evening. I know that everybody thinks that this is a very important topic. I certainly do. Show of hands. Everybody here, have you all been born? Okay, good. Now we don't have to worry about abortion for you people. Okay? Abortion, pro-life, extremely important, but there's another side to pro-life. What happens at the end of life? Anybody here dead yet? Anybody here ever died? No, not yet. Trust me, it's going to happen. Nobody gets off this planet alive. Even though even the astronauts come back, they die. So the point is that unless we understand the threats that are going on now to our right to life, there are pernicious governments and forces at work today and have been since the 1990s to abridge these rights. Certainly the right to life uh, from birth, from conception, has been under threat for quite some time. That's been extremely well you know, looked at. I'm not going to talk about that at all because people have done that. Thank God Roe v. Wade is finally going to be able to uh, But uh, the other side of this is sort of the sneaky side. This is what people don't hear, and it's the same types of outright lies and half-truths that have driven the abortion crowd, the, the euthanasian assisted suicide crowd is going exactly in the same direction. So it's a very complicated topic, and I'm going to work backwards, if you will. I'm going to start by talking about death. I know everybody's favorite topic. Um, and we're going to talk about dying because you don't hit death until you go through a process called dying. Then we're going to talk about care for the dying and then the perversion of caring for the dying into killing. Euthanasia assisted suicide. We're going to spend a particular amount of time with Canada. The uh, Medical Assistance in Dying Act. If you don't know what's going on just north of us, you really should. It is a case study and it is horrific. And then last but not least, what can we do to counteract this? Uh, I tend to call it medicalized killing. Other people have called it death by doctor and a whole variety of other euphemisms. But trust me, it is horrible. Now, um, we have made up a couple of different um, you know, bits of information if you want. There is a glossary of terms. I have pages here. Uh, there are references, but many of these are hyperlinked. So at the end of the talk, I will put up my email address if you want to have me email these to you. They're much easier to surf the web rather than typing an HTTP. I can send it all to you. You can click on these. There's a number of excellent resources. And I really want to mention the National Catholic Bioethics Center. I know not everybody here is Catholic, but the NCBC is really phenomenal in the amount of work that they do for hospice care, for palliative care, for education. This is one of their forms that you can take with you if anyone has a person that you're thinking about entering into hospice care. This is a questionnaire that you can ask the prospective hospice team or hospice place, and it gives a variety of questions that you might not think of ordinarily, but it's very useful to have it all gathered up in a single place. They also, the NCBC also provides consultative services. You don't have to be Catholic, you don't have to be a physician, you don't have to be a healthcare institution. If you have a bioethics question, they have an 800 number hotline you can call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You get a free consultation with a bioethicist. Really high quality. They do over 1,500 ethics consultations a year. Not just about end of life, not just about abortion, but all aspects of complex medical care. So keep them in mind. The NCBC, ncbcenter.org, fantastic site. Um, I'm taking their course in ethics consultation now. I've got two more lessons to do, we right? one more two-page paper, I'm out of here. But um, it's been fascinating and it has really solidified my
my understanding of bioethics as well as my own Catholic faith. As I said, you don't have to be Catholic to believe any or all of this. It does help, but it's not essential. Remember that uh, the Judeo-Christian um, you know, views on the bioethics have been in formation for 5,000 years. So we got a pretty good head start, and it is very important to keep in mind what we're looking at and how it's all laid out. So we're going to go into this. We're going to start by talking about the end of life, or death, OK? Up until about 60, 70 years ago, this was easy. How do you tell if somebody's dead? Not breathing, heart's not beating, OK? So cessation of vital functions, respiration, cardiac function. Once that happens, you're gone. That's it. Up until about 1960, that was not too difficult. Unfortunately, you know, people have a nasty tendency to figure out all sorts of neat things like cardiac resuscitation, CPR, uh, ventilators, cardiac assistive techniques, rafts of medication, intensive care units. Since the 1960s, it's no longer cut and dry. We see people all the time that suffer cardiac arrests, respiratory arrests, appear to be dead by the classic definition, but are able to be successfully resuscitated and brought back to meaningful, awake, aware, able to function states. Unfortunately, not everybody makes it to that point. So we can also, of course, medically administer hydration, nutrition, breathe for the people, help with the heart. There's all sorts of things that I'm really not going to get much into, except to say that it has complicated our ability to define when death occurs. So we had to come up with other criteria. So being a neurologist, this one is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I am a recovering neurologist. I stopped practicing about two years ago. So I'm, 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 you know, I'm going through the 12-step program. <laughs> but because cardiac and respiratory support, we need to figure out when someone had actually died by some other means. Because we can keep the heart beating, we can keep breathing for the patient beyond the point that the brain will actually be able to function. As it turns out, if you make brain death criteria correct, you're not going to keep respiratory and cardiac support going for very long because the body begins to fail over a relatively short period of time. So what are brain death criteria? And I will tell you, even these are under attack. Right now, the American Academy of Neurology is revising even brain death criteria to say, well, mostly dead is good enough. No, mostly dead is, is not good enough. Fortunately, that has failed. But that's going to come back again and again and again. They're even cheapening the definition of death. In my time and Jeff's time, which is still now, I hope, if you do it the right way, permanent cessation of brain, cerebellum, hypothalamus, brain stem function, every aspect of the brain must no longer be functioning. It doesn't mean that every cell has to die, but the brain has to cease function as an organ at every level of the brain. If you do it properly, and it's a very rigorous definition, you can reasonably, with a reasonable degree of medical certainty, state that patient has died. And then you can withdraw the other forms of life support because death is death. However, it has to be rigorously determined. You have to be extremely careful with this. And I cannot tell you the number of hours I have spent in intensive care units going through this and working and collaborating with our other intensive care unit members and intensivists and a variety of other people, looking at brain stem reflexes, checking to see if the patient truly cannot breathe, no other cause of unresponsiveness, often looking at EEG, angiography, transcranial Doppler, MRI scans, all sorts of things, all beneficial. We don't want to make a mistake. We don't want to say, yep, yeah, patient's dead, and then the next day you walk into the room and they're waving at you. That, that, that's not a good feeling. So this is a sample of a checklist. We're not going to go through all this, but you can see it's very comprehensive. You want to make sure that the patient's blood pressure is good, temperature is right, they're not having any electrolyte abnormalities, the blood sugars are good, they're not on any medications, on and on and on. And we were doing two separate assessments that might have changed recently. 
but then we also check to see if the patient can breathe or not by giving them the most potent stimulus uh, that there is, which is increased levels of carbon dioxide. If they don't breathe even with that, then the person you can state with a reasonable degree of medical certainty has indeed died. So, and then we can do other things to check and make sure. If there's no blood flow anywhere within the brain, within the head, the person cannot survive. That's what cerebral angiography, transcranial Doppler, spec scanning. MRIs are actually very good as well because it can show liquefaction of the brain and brain stem. We really, that can be very heartening to me and heartbreaking for the family. However, brain death is death in the same way that permanent cessation of the heart stopping is death. And then we can withdraw these other supports upon determination. Now, inevitably, if you do it right, within several days at most, the rest of the body will begin to fail as well once the brain has indeed died and the brain stem has died. So uh, you can keep uh, ventilators and cardiac support going for a very short time to keep kidneys, liver, other organs. If the person decided to be an organ donor, you can keep them vital long enough to perhaps save other lives. But death, very, very important. That's how we've been determining it. And I will tell you that, the, that everything's under attack. So even now, these brain death criteria, people are trying to cheat them. Absolutely dead set against that. Stefan's Quintet. This is a series of five galaxies. I figured I'd put something nice in here. <laughs> okay, so talking about death being a normal part of life, unfortunately we're all going to see it sooner or later. Dying, on the other hand, is a process. It's something we all go through in order to reach a line called death. You're dying, you're dying, you're dying, you're dead. <laughs> That's it. There's no more dying after that. And Catholics like to believe that you're actually being born into eternal life. And I'm sure anybody with religion believes that as well. I'm not going to speak about the religions. Okay, dying and death have been taken away from most people here have probably never seen a person actually dying unless you've made a concerted effort to do so. A hundred years ago, 1923, almost everyone who died, died at home. Most of the time, the funerals were held at home. You would see the dead person's body, you would bathe the body, you would respectfully treat it, you would have the, the viewing there, the body would be taken from there to the church, to the cemetery. Children would see it. Everyone knew what life and death was all about. Man, now, less than 25% of people. It was much lower before, but now, thanks to hospice care and such, that's actually come up a bit. Now, it's all sequestered in a hospital or hospice, and the dead move to a funeral home. You might never actually see a dying person unless you really make an effort to do so. And that's a shame because there is so much that you can learn and give to the dying. And they really need all the support we can give them. And this horrific situation during COVID, which we were isolated from everybody and couldn't go in, was just horrible. So the dying process itself is very much misunderstood by everybody. The public doesn't get it anymore. Legislators certainly don't. All politicians, generally, whatever branch they're in, even some medical personnel, it's amazing the degree of lack of knowledge in certain aspects of the dying process because we're trained, we're trained in trying to treat the people but not in helping people get through the dying process. That's where palliative care and hospice care comes in. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So everybody has some ground to make up. And, of course, it is frightening. Why? Loss of autonomy. Autonomy, ability to speak for oneself. Okay? As you're dying, you lose more and more capability. You can't get to the bathroom on your own. You can't get your own meals. It's harder to get up, to get around. So you lose your ability to you know, take care of yourself. There's always pain, which is a concern. More important is suffering. Suffering 
is that I should have actually put this in the reverse order because pain is a subset of suffering. Suffering can take many, many, many different, um, different aspects. So pain is only one of those, but the suffering of somebody who wanted to get out and see their sister and they're just too far away and they can't make it, that's suffering, okay? Uh, wanting to, I mean, even little things, wanting to finish that long book you've been dying to read, well, literally dying, um, but they can't do it, okay? Wanting to stay alive long enough to see that your grandson graduate from high school, you may not be able to do it. All of those are forms of suffering. And there's economic suffering, there's other aspects of it. So, and then of course, whatever prior meaning your life had diminishes as one goes through this process. So we lose all of this, and that, of course, is extremely frightening. Not everybody wants to you know, face up to this. So how can we take care of this? So we care for the dying. I'm sure everybody's heard about heroic care. I don't want heroic measures, blah, blah, blah. We don't like those terms. They're very imprecise. They don't give us really good ideas as to what's going on, ordinary versus heroic care. We try to bring in newer terminology saying ordinary versus extraordinary. Well, that sounded good until it turned out philosophers and medicine don't use it the same way. So we came up with proportionate versus disproportionate means of care. And I'll define these for you so you have an idea of what we're talking about. But it's, it's fairly intuitive. So ordinary or proportionate care is care which is proven to be successful. It is um, uh, customarily used, in other words, where we are in America, pretty much everything is customarily used. There is a reasonable hope of benefit, and it does not impose significant burdens. And by a disproportionate burden, that is defined by the patient or the patient's proxy, the patient's you know, decision maker, if they can't make it themselves. Very seldom will that decision, or should it be made, by the healthcare team or the administrator or the insurance company. So these categories are very important to say, okay, this is ordinary care. So those means do not involve any grave burden for oneself or another, and according to circumstances of person, places, times, and culture. This was taken right out of you know one of my books, so it's a little convoluted, but at the same time, it gives you a pretty good feel of what it is now. Extraordinary, on the other hand, not proven to be successful, not customarily used. For instance, experimental treatments. Um, not a reasonable hope of benefit. There might be some hope, but of course, if there's no hope, you really don't do it. Or it imposes a disproportionate burden. Too expensive, too painful, too rare, cannot be gotten a hold of. So any type of care, this is very interesting, may be proportionate or disproportionate depending upon that patient's circumstance. I'll tell you a little story. When my father was dying in the 1990s, 1994, the year before my father was born, there's another story about that we'll get to later. But he was dying. He was in a, uh, he had cancer, survived the first bout of cancer with chemotherapy, five years, long enough for him to get prostate cancer and break his hip. Finally, the lung cancer came back. There was really no hope. We tried another course of chemo, knocked out his white count. I told him, Dad, you just can't take any more. He was a gambler. He wanted to. But finally, it came to be his time. He was in a lot of pain. He was on a morphine drip. So it was keeping him comfortable. We were able to go in and see him for the last day or so of his life. We were near me. He was around Philadelphia. So he was quiet. He was in the hospital bed, which is where they could best care for him. And he was absolutely quiet. He'd rouse a little bit if you spoke to him, otherwise he was calm. Every six hours or every four hours, the nurses would come in and give him ordinary care. They would roll him on one side or the other to prevent bed sores. They would do respiratory percussion to break up any globs of mucus in his lungs. And he would wake out and cry out in pain. This was a man who was going to be dead within 24 hours. At this point, that ordinary care disproportionate or extraordinary care. And I asked the nurses, you know, he's, we're, we're really getting to the point he is imminently, actively dying. Can we please not roll him? He's not going to get a bed sore in the amount of time that he'll survive. 
he's not going to get pneumonia, he's, he's dying. And they said, yeah, okay, that's reasonable. <clears throat> and I stayed with him the rest of that night. Some of us went home the next morning to grab some food in the shower. He died that morning when most of us were away. I think he wanted to do it that way. My mother and my oldest brother was there. So that's a really good example of what would normally be ordinary care becoming extraordinary due to circumstances. And no person is obligated to receive extraordinary disproportionate care. You may if you want to. If there's an experimental treatment and you want to try it, go for it. However, you're not obligated to. However, you are obligated to use proportionate care. So I think that's very interesting. So extraordinary care, patient may elect to forego treatment. And once you try it, if you find out it doesn't work or causes too many problems, whoop, it's 7 o'clock. You can discontinue it. Part of my eye drops. So, measures which may unintentionally hasten death may sometimes be permissible. We'll talk about that. That's the principle of double effect. We'll get to that in a minute. So, care of the critically ill, we are obligated always to give proportionate care to all persons, knowing that the proportionate care may turn out to be disproportionate depending upon circumstances. Disproportionate care is not obligatory. For instance, giving somebody cardiopulmonary uh, bypass and doing uh, uh, you know, surgeries for a person who's imminently dying. It may be indicated for somebody who's only 45 years old that somebody who's actively dying clearly isn't. So you can forego those treatments. And again, a nice quote from the uh, Continental Council. No moral obligation and recourse to extraordinary measures exists, and a doctor must follow the wishes of a sick person who refuses such measures. Vitally important. Patients have rights, and if the patient cannot speak for himself or herself, the patient's health care proxy has those rights as well, which is why everybody here should have a, a health care proxy sign. And don't care as much for living wills. We can talk about that, but that's not about today's topic. We should all have a health care proxy. We should have it filled out. Let somebody know who it is, and make sure that they share your values. Now, the principle of double effect, I don't want to go too much into this, but it is an ethical principle which allows an actor, a physician, a nurse, someone else, to properly judge whether an action is morally licit or not. In other words, is it moral, is it immoral? How do we judge? Well, this action can have a good and a bad effect at the same time. So how do you judge if something that you want to do is an appropriate treatment of it. And I'll give you the example. So um, the best example that we probably give is the use of morphine, okay, for a person in severe, intractable pain. Morphine is an excellent analgesic, and we have tons of other analgesics that are usually opiate medications. Opiates are excellent. They relieve pain. They can calm persons down. But one of the side effects is that it can reduce a person's respiratory drive and may even stop a person from breathing. And that might cause a person to die sooner than they otherwise would have. Well, that's a bad effect. Okay? Killing a patient is never a good thing to do. So the question is, is it okay to use such a treatment? Well, these rules, which have been worked out since the 13th century, okay, can really help you figure it out. The action itself has to be good or morally neutral. The good effect, not the bad effect, has to be intended. So we're talking about the action and the intention. And the good effect is not produced by the bad effect. And that there has to be a very grave reason for doing this and permitting that bad, foreseen but unintended effect uh, to take place. So the action itself has to be good or morally neutral. The action has to be good in itself and again, it concerns the object of the action, okay? Pain relief, relief of suffering, analgesics from narcotics, really excellent example, there are many of them. So the action has to be good or morally neutral. Things that are bad, like killing the person to relieve their pain is a bad thing. Slavery is only bad. Degrading of the human person is really bad. There was a case in the United Kingdom, I think Scotland, 
or a person had body dysmorphic disorder, said two of his fingers were horrible, they had to be removed. And that is degradation of the human person, and uh, it's an attack on personal integrity, and the surgeon did it anyway. So that's going to pop up somewhere else. So that's a bad, okay, that's a bad intention. Good effect, not the bad effect is intended, relieves pain, reduces respiratory drive, may cause a dying person to expire. Now, if you go in with <coughs> five milligrams of morphine, which is a very reasonable dose for most people in this room, and that will relieve pain, but may slow the person's respiratory drive, that's acceptable. If you go in with 500 milligrams of morphine, you say I'm gonna relieve their pain by killing them. That's a bad intention. So you can see where the intention is by being honest with yourself. What are you trying to do? You're trying to control pain and recognize if the patient dies in these extraordinary circumstances. Okay, that's acceptable. If you're trying to kill the person in order to relieve their suffering, that's never acceptable. So it deals with the intention of the action. If the intention is illicit, the action is illicit. So that 500 milligrams never Okay, so the good effect is not produced by the bad effect. There's no evil means to a good end. So removal of a healthy organ or body part, no, not a good effect. Affirmative psychotherapy, I don't even want to get started on that because I can spend two hours talking about that one. That is somebody saying, hey, I think I'm a cat. I think I'm a you know, lounge chair. Okay, yes, that's exactly what you want. Right? Our professional societies should be collectively taken out and spanked. All of them. Okay. So, proportionally grave reason. So, saving a life, pain relief for the dying, relief of suffering for the dying, all proportionately good reasons. Oops. Okay. And there are other potential criteria, but we're not going to go on. So, care for the dying. We always try to cure if we can. If we can't, we always, always, always must care. Palliative care, excellent stuff. Now, palliative care, as you might see on your uh, on your gazetteer here, is care for the entire person. All the other aspects, in addition to medical care, the socioeconomic, spiritual well-being, emotional well-being, even um, the financial well-being, all can come under the rubric of palliative care. And any person with a serious medical problem would qualify for palliative care. Hospice care, on the other hand, is a subset of palliative care that specifically is for the dying. And this is covered by Medicare. And usually it has to be that you are going to be dying within six months of uh, the time that this is looked at. So you know, there are ways to go about this. The patient always should receive proportionate or ordinary care. Disproportionate care may be tried but it doesn't have to be. Maybe discontinue, uh, it doesn't have to be. That's up to the patient or the patient's privacy. And usually the patient or the surrogate makes that choice. Rarely a physician may need to step in under extremely circumstances, very extreme circumstances. Try to avoid it. You know this guy is. Yeah. Yeah, Oh, yeah. No, now everybody's getting a visceral reaction. Looked real happy. Okay, so he was a big proponent of his suicide machine. So we're going to get into the medicalized killing force. Euthanasia and assisted suicide. The difference is euthanasia is a healthcare worker directly steps in and kills a patient using medical means. Okay? Uh, assisted suicide, some healthcare provider provides the means of death, prescribing medications, and then the patient performs the act. As far as I'm concerned, they're two sides of the same coin. They're both unjust killing. Okay, there are just killings. Okay, murder is an unjust killing. You know, killing in a war or killing in self-defense are just killings. These are unjust. Nobody deserves to be killed for these things. So, and then there are different categories. You'll hear about active, passive, voluntary, involuntary, blah blah blah. Just to find them for you, active. An action which ends the patient's life, an act of commission. Going in, 500 milligrams of morphine IV. Passive, withholding, life-sustaining therapy, hydration, nutrition, <coughs>